The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Thank you for changing the world. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm beginning my fourth week of teaching on discipleship. And I have some new materials that I've entitled Discipleship Evangelism. Uh, that title may not communicate to you if you haven't watched this series, but I'm, what I've been teaching is that God didn't call us to just evangelize. He told us to make disciples. And as we make disciples, we will evangelize and reach more people than we would ever do by doing evangelism and then trying to use discipleship as follow-up. It needs to be discipleship first and then evangelism. And some people, that just is a, a major shift in their thinking, and they think, how can this be? You need to get the materials. And also this last week, I've been using the scriptures where Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, some things to do. And, and I, I read these whole passages of Scripture, these four or five verses, but I, for the last few days of last week, I just focused on where he said, let no man despise thy youth. And I've been emphasizing how he didn't tell Timothy to stop the people from despising him, but basically he was saying, don't let their evaluation affect your evaluation of yourself and who you are and what you can do. And I tell you, this is major. This is just different than the way most people think. Most people are limping through life because somebody did something to them and they feel justified. They feel trapped like I can't help it because this person did this to me. That is not true. You've got a choice whether you become bitter or better. And even by me saying that, many people are going to say, you're condemning me and you're just adding to my problems and so you want to run, switch off the TV and, and go the other direction. But did you know that that's not freedom? That's not liberty. Real freedom is when you can sit there and even if people don't like you and if they criticize you and if they persecute you and if they do something wrong to you, real freedom is saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's what Jesus did. He was secure. And even when he was suffering and in the process of dying unjustly for our sins, he was able to think about the other people and, and bless them. Now that's freedom. That's liberty to say, Father, forgive them. But you know what bondage is? Is to say, Father, change them because look what they did to me. That's bondage. Freedom is to let them go because you're so secure in the Lord. Boy, those are powerful things that we've been talking about. And let's go back to this verse. It says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. The word but here is a conjunction. That means it's a figure of speech that ties two thoughts or two sentences together. He's saying, don't let people despise you. How do you do that? You do it by being an example. Now, this is really important because a person might have... Uh, embrace some of the things that I've said last week about don't let people despise you, but the way they're going to do it is by flexing their muscles. And every time anybody criticizes them, anytime somebody does something wrong, they want to fight back. They want to hurt you the way that you've hurt them. That's not what Paul's doing. The way you do it is by being an example. You just keep doing what God told you to do. And I tell you, if you'll do that, it's tremendous. Let me use this story. I've used this a bunch of times, and some of you, I'm sure, have heard this, but this is, this is major in my life, and it fits perfectly. This is such a great example. I'd like to hear it again myself. So um, anyway, please listen, even if you've heard this. But there was a time when I first got turned on to the Lord. I was still in the Baptist church, but I was preaching non-Baptist doctrine, and because of it, I was being criticized, and I was trying to justify myself. And I was trying to stop these people's criticism by getting in and arguing with them and trying to explain to them and doing all of these things. And in the midst of that turmoil that was going on in my life, I went to a meeting. 
that was held by my good friend, Joe Nay. He was kind of like my mentor, the guy that got me going. And I went to his meeting, and out of hundreds of people, he called me forward. And he said, Andrew, he says, I see you like a runner on a track. You're running on one of these oval tracks. And he says, you're leading the race. You're doing good. But the people in the grandstands are yelling at you and criticizing you and telling you you're doing it all wrong. And he says, I see you getting off of the track and running up into the grandstands and arguing with the spectators. And he said, even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the race. Get back on track. Stay on track. And if that isn't obvious to you, that was just one powerful word to me that I have used and I have, I've really controlled my life with that. And this relates to what we were talking about. The way you keep other people from despising you isn't by getting off of the track and getting there and arguing with them and trying to justify yourself. Did you know even if you won the argument, then Satan really has won and kept you from winning the race because you're no longer doing what God told you to do. You're over here trying to justify yourself. You know, if... I've got people that criticize me and do a lot of things, and I could come on television and I could start trying to justify and explain this and explain that, and let's expose this person and show that they're the ones that's wrong and not me. And even if I won the argument, Satan would win because I'd no longer be preaching the gospel. I'd no longer be telling people the word, but instead I'd be defending myself. And I tell you, there's not very many people that are secure enough in the Lord that when somebody criticizes them that they can just keep on doing what God calls them to do. But instead, they want to get up in the grandstands and they want to try and justify themselves and win this argument because it's all about self. No, there's something more important than you. There's something a lot more important than you and that's your relationship with God, what God has called you to do. And you know what? You need to do it. And don't let the spectators get you off of the track and into the grandstands arguing with them. You know, I could use a million examples of this. I've had this happen a lot. When you preach the gospel, and if you preach the true gospel, there is going to be criticism. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you hadn't been criticized and persecuted, you hadn't preached the true gospel. And this doesn't only apply to ministers. This applies to anybody who's really standing up and preaching the gospel. And so I could give you hundreds and hundreds of examples of this. But, you know, even with my in-laws, Jamie's parents, uh, they did not want us to get married. Jamie's dad told her the week before we announced that we were going to get married, you stay away from Andrew Womack. <laughs> he wasn't for it. It was a rough beginning. We had some hardship, and over the first couple of years, it exploded to where Jamie's dad yelled at me and said, I'm just like all those other Pentecostal believers, and he, he was a Baptist, and he got mad at me and told me terrible things. And um, anyway, there was problems. And, you know, we could have done something to sit there and either try and justify ourselves or to do this. Instead, we just kept doing what God told us to do. We love them. I've never been mad at Jamie's parents. Uh, when I, I mean, he, uh, Jamie's dad yelled at me, and when I finally got ready to leave the house, I stood at the door and I said, can I come back? Because I wasn't sure he'd ever let me back in the house. And, you know, he thought about it for a long time. I mean, it was probably a minute it, it felt like an hour. And he finally said, well, she's our daughter. We'll let you come back with her. That's the way he responded. And you know what? We just kept fellowshipping with them as much as we could with this huge distance between us. But over a period of time, here's my point in telling this story, is that over a period of time, he finally said, you just won us over by your love for us. And we just kept doing what God told us to do. And Jamie's dad became one of my best friends. I really enjoyed BF. We played golf together. We did a lot of things. I'd just go over and see him. They became some of the biggest supporters in our ministry. And before they died, I mean, we were just really close to them. Jamie's mother even bragged on me at times. I mean, God turned it around, but he didn't turn it around because we compromised or changed. We just kept doing what God told us to do. 
And I can tell you that there are a lot of people that when we first started in ministry, it looked like we had absolutely lost our mind. We left good paying jobs. We left security. We left all of these things to go out and start holding Bible studies. We needed to starve to death for years. And I guarantee you there was probably a decade after I committed myself to being in the ministry that there was not one positive thing that to a person who wasn't totally in agreement with us, there wasn't uh, a positive thing that would have convinced any skeptic that we were called to the ministry. We struggled financially. We struggled with people persecuting, saying things about us. Things were going wrong. And you know what? It, it just looked bad. And there's a lot of people that thought, you're never going to make it. There's a lot of people that said all kinds of things. But rather than us getting off of the track and running into the grandstands and defending ourselves and trying to prove to them and convince them, you know what? We just kept doing what God told us to do. And I literally, if I had time, could mention at least 100. I'm sure probably much more than 100 people who just wrote us off. But over the years, as we kept going, they have seen the blessing of God. They have seen the power of God in manifestation. Now they can see us worldwide in reaching people. And I have had many, many, many people who wrote us off come back around. You know why? Because I just stayed on the track. I kept doing. It's what Paul was telling Timothy. Don't let people despise you. Well, how do you keep that from happening? By getting in there and explaining everything and talking to them and justifying yourself? No, just do what God told you to do. Be an example. And he gives specifics. I'm going to go through each one of these specifics, but the principle here of just live a godly life. Just do what God called you to do. And there's people that will criticize you, but over a period of time, they'll actually come around and they'll be converted and they'll come to it. Let God deal with it. Here's another lesson that I learned. It says in Romans chapter 12, Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. I will repay. God takes care of things. When he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, Saul at that time, he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And God intervened and took care of his people. Praise God. Saul had enough wisdom to respond positively and became the apostle Paul. But I mean, God took these things personally. God will take care of you. It's not going to always happen in this life. There are people who've been martyred for their faith. And there will be more people who will be martyred for their faith. But I can guarantee you someday we're going to stand before the Lord and those people who have served God and have been persecuted, they're going to shine like the sun while the people who persecuted them are going to be flat on their face realizing, man, I have sinned against God. They'll be crying and begging for mercy. It'll be too late then. But my point is that, you know what, I have had people come out against me and I have just kept doing what God called me to do. And the Lord has defended me. If you defend yourself, God won't defend you. But if you will entrust this to God, if you will step back and let God be God, God will take care of defending you better than you can defend yourself. And this works on every level. I've used this a lot of times uh, with uh, people who are married. And I've seen a lot of people who tried to be the Holy Spirit and tried to convince their mate and make them do this. And they're praying, oh, God, help them to see all of this. And you are, you just make a poor Holy Spirit. And if you get in and try and manipulate and force your mate, you know what? It's not going to work. Many of them are going to say, well, you know, even if God speaks to them, the maid is going to think, you know, that I have this thought, but that, that's my wife. That's my husband. They've been telling me this, and they'll write it off and not recognize that it's God. You know, let me see if I can do this real quickly. I had not got time to turn over to these scriptures. But when Mary got pregnant, the virgin birth, it says that right after the angel overshadowed her, she immediately went into the hill country to visit her... Um, cousin Elizabeth who was six months pregnant at the time and she spent three months with Elizabeth and then when she came back to Nazareth it says she was found with child it didn't say she told people that she was pregnant 
she was found pregnant. If you study that and think about it, it means that people could see that she was pregnant. She had been gone for three months, and she was now three months into the pregnancy, and she was beginning to show. Now, here's the significance of what I'm saying. I don't believe, and I haven't got time to establish this, so I'll just present it as andeology. I know that this is contrary to our Christmas traditions and everything that we say, but I believe it's Scripture. I don't believe that Mary told Joseph about the visitation of the angel and her having a virgin birth. There's nothing in Scripture that implies, matter of fact, there's a lot in Scripture that implies that she didn't. She rose up immediately and went into the hill country and was gone for three months. She didn't call Joseph on the cell phone and tell him what was going on. They didn't have letters as such. There was no communication. And when she got back, all of a sudden, after being gone for three months, she's three months pregnant. And it's obvious that Joseph thought that she had had a relationship with somebody else and he was going to divorce her privately. Instead of publicly, he had the ability to stone her to death. But instead, he was going to do it privately because apparently he really did love Mary and he didn't want to make her a public disgrace. And so he was going to do it privately. And while he thought on these things, a dream came to him. And in the dream, the Lord told him, Joseph... Don't be afraid to take Mary your wife because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost and you shall call his name Jesus. Here's my point. If Mary had tried to tell him all of these things and convince him, first of all, how do you tell somebody that I'm pregnant but I'm a virgin? <laughs> you know why? There aren't enough words to convey that. There, I think it would have been wasted effort. I think it's to Mary's credit that she just trusted God with this and let God be the one to defend to her. And she took what God had revealed to her and she was going with it and she was facing the consequences, whatever they were. I personally do not believe that she tried to convince Joseph. And therefore, because she didn't, when this dream came, and it says specifically in Matthew, it was a dream. It wasn't a visible something. It wasn't while he was wide awake. How many of you have ever had a dream? And regardless of how real it is, when you wake up, you realize that that's just a dream. And you think, man, I'm not sure if that was God or whatever. If Mary had tried to tell Joseph these things, if all of that information would have been fed to him by Mary it would have been easy for him to dismiss this and think, well, you know what? That's just a dream that these thoughts were planted there by Mary. She told me all of this, and he could have dismissed it and continued on his course of divorcing her. But because I believe she didn't share with him, and she left this up to God, and she just was an example. She just was loving God and doing what God told her to do. Then when God spoke to Joseph, he knew that this was God. I mean, this was unbelievable that it could be a virgin birth. This is not something that had ever come into his mind. Nobody had ever told him this. And it was easy to say that this must be God. And then when he shared with Mary and said that the Lord said we're supposed to name him Jesus, she, she could have said uh, that's a confirmation. And I believe that it was much more powerful if it worked that way than for Mary trying to talk to Joseph. And the reason I bring all of this up is to say that, again, she just, by example, did what God told her to do, and that left God free to come in and defend her and to show Joseph what had really happened. But if she had gotten in and tried to be the Holy Spirit and convinced Joseph on her own, he could have written all of that dream off as, that was Mary that planted all of these thoughts in my heart. Likewise, there are many of you watching this program that God has told you to do something, you're receiving flack for it, and you wonder why God hasn't done something. It's because he can't get a word in edgewise. It's because he can't say anything that you haven't already said five or six times. And if he was trying to speak to the other person and let them know that what you were doing is correct, how would they recognize it as being God's voice instead of your voice? I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this doesn't make sense to your natural mind, but I'm telling you that this is what these verses are saying. This is what the Bible teaches, that you need to let God defend you. Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. I will repay. Let God defend you. It is not so important that you be proven right.
It's important that you do what God told you to do. And if people misunderstand, even if it's your husband, your wife, your children, your family, your friends, your friends at church or whoever, you don't have to sit there and defend yourself. You know, I've actually had my staff try and defend me because people write blogs and say lies about us. And they say, well, there's things that we can do. And I told them, I said, I'm not getting off the track. I'm not getting into the grandstands. I am not defending myself. I am not going to take one ounce of my time trying to defend myself. I'm going to tell people the truths of the gospel and stay on track. I tell you, this has worked for me. And I have had people that have hated me that it had people burn my books, tell people I'm of the devil. And if I would have confronted them, I might have convinced them. I doubt it, but if I had have convinced them, it would have been just between them and me. But when I just left it in God's hand, I've had people come up in front of a thousand people and fall down on the floor and grab my feet and go to crying and say, please forgive me because God defended me. God took care of it and I didn't defend myself. God will treat you better than you'd treat yourself. God can defend you better than you'd defend yourself. Don't let people despise you, but not by you standing up and arguing and stating your case and trying to make everybody bow the knee. Just be an example. Just do what God told you to do, and it'll work. You know, we've got a lot of women in our Bible school that get flack for being a woman minister. And there's a lot of people that think a woman can't teach men. I can scripturally answer that, and I will answer it if a person ans asks me a question and they're sincere, they aren't argumentative. But you know what I've told so many women? I said, don't send, spend time trying to take and defend yourself and tell people that you can minister and stuff. Just do it. And let the anointing of God be witnessed in your life. And when people see this power of God, those with a pure heart will recognize it. You know, in my case... I went and watched Catherine Kuhlman, and I was in the Baptist church at the time, and I was told that a woman could not teach a man. But I had heard about her, I'd seen her on television, and I wanted to go see, and the way, only way I could get in, because it was packed out, was to be an usher. And I literally, as an usher, had to take people off of stretchers and out of wheelchairs and put them in seats to clear the aisles for the fire code. And I remember one woman who was on a stretcher. She was as close to death as any person I've ever seen who was still alive. And I was able to put my hand, close my fingers around her thigh. She was bone. She could not stand. She couldn't sit. And I took her out and put her in a chair. And then I went down front and I watched Catherine Kuhlman. And she was weird. And I was offended. And I didn't like her. But then... Miracles started happening, and one of them was this woman that I had put my hand around her thigh, running up and down the aisles, pushing her stretcher. And even though I didn't understand, I, I recognized that that was the power of God. And you know what? I went back and changed my theology, and I began to start reading until I found out. But see, she didn't spend any time sitting there justifying women in ministry. She just flowed in the power and the anointing of God, and by example, she won me over. There are so many of you that are demanding that people submit and respond. Just love them. Just do what God told you to do. Go on past them. And you know what? God will take care of it. Be an example. That's how you stop other people's criticism of you. I'm out of time today, but I do encourage you to get these materials. I promise you they would be a tremendous help to you. So listen as our announcer gives you this information. Call or write today and then join me again tomorrow as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's complete teaching titled Discipleship Evangelism is available on either CD or on DVD as seen on TV. Each is available for 13 pounds. Make sure to specify whether you want the CD or DVD series when you contact us. Or you can get today's teaching as part of the discipleship package. This package includes your choice of either the CD or DVD series, the Discipling Through Galatians book, the Discipling Through Romans book, and the complete discipleship evangelism course. These tools have been designed so that anyone, anywhere, at any time can reach an unbeliever, disciple a new believer, or grow with others in the Lord. The entire package has a catalog value of 60 pounds 50. 
But Andrew considers these resources so important, he'd like to get them to as many people as possible. Therefore, he's offering this package to you for just 45 pounds. Remember to specify the CD or DVD series when you order. The third audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this third CD titled, Are You Listening to the Critics? Free of Charge. We'd also like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled, Effortless Change for £8.50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. Karis Bible College graduates are changing lives. Russ and David Forgeston and David's wife Judith moved to India upon graduating from CBC and immediately began spreading the gospel truth, establishing Karis Bible College India and helping with individual and small business loans as well. CBC India has just celebrated its first graduating class and is sending ministers throughout India's villages, towns, and cities, changing the world one life at a time. For more information on this and other stories, visit awmi.net. Click on Ministry News and discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries. Invest yourself in Karis Bible College and Andrew Womack Ministries today. I was born with congenital heart disease. The doctors gave up hope on recovery for me. I was turning the TV on one night while I was up taking medication, and there was Andrew teaching on God's kind of love. And he was talking right to me. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, the Lord said, Behold, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. The Lord says that there's really only two options. There's life or death, blessing or cursing. Sometimes we think that there's all these other options, but the truth is really every decision you make is either moving you closer to God, which is life and blessing, or it's moving you away from God, which is towards death and cursing. And the good news is God gave you that choice. Well, after listening to Andrew's teachings, I uh, studied the Word night and day, and God spoke to me, and He told me all was healed, all was well, even while I felt miserable, and I just left that identity. I left that sickness, and I'm healed. <laughs> 